Let's get lit. Eileen Prusher takes you behind the words and beyond. Hello, literary lovers. Welcome back to Let's Get Lit. My guest on today's show is Michael Dickel. He's a writer, photographer, and artist. He holds degrees in psychology, creative writing, and literature. He is the chair of the Israel Association of Writers in English. He's received top awards in the 2008 and 2009 Ruben Rose Poetry Competitions, and he's edited several poetry journals. His poetry, prose, and photographs have appeared in small press literary journals, anthologies, art books, and online since 1987. Some of his Poems have been translated into a few different languages, including Romanian, Serbian, and Tamil. His last book of poems was Midwest, Mid East, and he has been working on a bilingual edition of the collection with Gili Chaimovich, who has translated the poems into Hebrew. His newest book of poems is called War Surrounds Us. It will be released in June, and a book of flash fiction called The Toad's Garden will be coming out by the end of the year. Michael Dickel, it is a pleasure. Pleasure to have you here. Hi, Aileen. It's a pleasure to be here. This chapbook of poems, War Surrounds Us, uh, was very powerful for me to read uh, because I, like you, live here, live in Jerusalem, have small children, uh, and it brought me right back to the experience of going through the war this past summer. I think we were actually uh, communicating on Facebook and in person during some of this about the difficulties with the children in particular. Exactly, and, and what to tell them and what to hide. Now, were you writing these poems every day throughout the war, or did you write some of them afterwards, kind of reflecting on the experience of war? Most of them I wrote as things were unfolding, and uh, you can tell that in some of cases because they're referring to things in real time that situations that changed later. Um, a few of the poems, particularly in the epilogue, uh, the the last section are more reflections after the fact, looking back. But most of them I wrote. At, I don't know that I wrote every day. I I wrote a lot though during that time. Not all of what I wrote is here. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was one poem in uh, particular that, that struck me um, that was, uh, well, they all struck me, but mm -hmm. one of them uh, was about um, this teacher, Ruhama, who was mm -hmm. uh, the kindergarten or preschool teacher for your son, had also been at one point for my son, who lost yeah. her son, Moshe, during the war. Yeah, that was a very difficult moment. Um, Ruhama used to, uh, used to say to our Moshe, I have Moshe at home. It still is hard for me. We never told Moshe, by the way. Um, about Ruhama losing about her Ruhama son. About Ruhama losing her son. I didn't know how to tell a four-year-old. Yeah. I, and he I wasn't four yet. Not quite four. Tell me about you as a writer, Michael, and your evolution um, into becoming a, a poet. I know you started out life in America. Is it Minnesota? That comes up in one of your poems. Um, I live most of my adult life in Minnesota. I moved mm -hmm. there at 17, finished high school, my last year of high school in Minnesota. I grew up outside of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, my evolution as a poet, uh, I, I can remember writing a couple of poems in grade school. And um, I actually won an award in junior high school for my poetry before I graduated junior high school. They had a poetry contest, and I was an editor of the high school literary magazine and submitted poems. I wouldn't necessarily um, want anyone to read any of those <laughs> poems from those days. Um, but interestingly enough, I was actually thinking about that uh, recently, and I think that uh, some of the themes still come out. My grade school poems that I remember both have to do with nature, and nature is very much one of the images and themes I use in my work now. And uh, the junior high school poem and the high school poem had a lot to do with sort of uh, cos um, cosmology the, and mysticism and things which also come out as images and tropes in my poems. So it's interesting that those themes have kept going. What I found, I had a career as a counselor for about 11 years after graduating from uh, my first degree in psychology, and I was, was constantly writing. And at some point, I sort of discovered that you could actually you know, study creative writing in a graduate program, and I could do it at the local university, the University of Minnesota. And I started doing that, well, as a side thing, taking, you know, taking some courses to strengthen my skills. And that's uh, sort of led me to my second and third degrees. 
And a lot of my um, development was in that program, but not uh, not in sort of the conventional way. It wasn't actually an MFA program yet. It is now. And it wasn't necessarily conventional in, in the sense that I really made a relationship with a mentor, um, Michael Dennis Brown, uh, a Minnesota poet. And um, I got to meet people like Robert Bly and, and get some lessons from him and talk wow. to him about poetry. And this, these are major influences, of course. And mostly, I think my evolution has been that it's that kind of thing that I can't turn my back on. I can't stop writing, even when I've tried on a couple of occasions, said that I've enough and thrown up my hands um, and get frustrated. But uh, it keeps making me come back to it. <laughs> It's fascinating when I think about you, you know, starting out uh, life outside of Chicago and then Minnesota and then coming here to Israel. Some of those themes came up in the poems of yours that I read, you know, lines like this estranged land, strangling land that expands and contracts around me. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was very interesting, this idea of kind of feeling at home here and then another part of you saying this is not this is not home. It's 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 dry and rough compared to. The place you grew up in America, which is much a uh, bit moist. more moist, lush. <laughs> yeah, and Minnesota, the land of ten thousand lakes, and that's not an exaggeration. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, there is that feeling. Uh, I have a poem uh, earlier from my Aliyah that actually talks very directly about how this, how Israel, when I visited, seemed much more like home than when I moved here. Hmm. Um, I felt really at home when I visited, but then when I actually moved here and, and got into it, it looks like it's similar, and yet it's not as similar as it looks. And uh, so th- that theme is definitely in some of the poetry, and it probably got, wore into this one. Uh, interestingly, I mean, the the summer before I made Aliyah, I was actually here was the summer of 2006, was the second the, Lebanon war. The last war. big war we had. And, yeah. I, and I, um, I was in Sfat, and I had to move from Sfat to Jerusalem, and, and that was my first experience of that kind of war at all, obviously, mm. living in the, in the Midwest of the U.S. You don't experience wars. I mean, they haven't been a good war there since 1812 or something or <laughs> <laughs> no, a civil war. Um, but I, uh, it wasn't the same partly because of the young kids. I mean, not partly. It, it's significantly because of the young kids. It's a lot different when you're an adult. It's different when you're an adult who could choose to leave. I chose not to in 2006. I stayed the whole time I planned to stay when I came. It was an extended visit. Um, but once you have kids and you have responsibilities, the very thing you sort of started talking about, it really made it feel different. The war felt a lot different to me that way. Also, the rock. I mean, I came to Jerusalem and in 2006, the rockets weren't falling here and they did fall here and we did go into the bomb shelters here. Yeah, this war of this past summer really uh, was a game changer in that way. Maybe we could actually um, allow that to let us segue into you mm-hmm. reading one of the poems about the war. All right. This is The Cost of Yellow. And uh, the inspiration actually was literally pulling into the parking lot um, at the college campus where I teach, uh, Hakabutsin College of Education, Technology, and Arts. I think that's the whole t- title of it, Hakabutsin. And the beautiful yellow flowers and the trees and the petals were carpeting the parking lot and the contrast with the fact that at the same time we could actually hear some rumbling when I was there for the that day for a meeting wow. of a couple of rockets had fallen. So this is the cost of yellow. I know there's a war going on, but yellow flowers cover trees in the parking lot as I pull in. True, missiles shatter lives while destroying buildings but fallen petals cover the tarmac with a fairy yellow glow. Yes, sirens send us underground while rockets dread flares, and these too crash stupendously, but the sea air waves a soft, humid blanket spread out by soothing breezes. So easily I forget the price of wind, the cost of yellow. So hard to forget the lone cry of a carrion crow perched high in the tree with sharp eyes turned toward the horizon. I enjoyed that uh, when I I first read it ahead of our meeting, and I I, I caught that uh, 
Rockets dread flares. Yeah. <laughs> Rockets red glare. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes. I wondered, you know, how many, how many of your uh, readers uh, catch that the uh, kind of um, turning on its head that yeah. uh, you well, know the, the, the glorious way that we're taught to look at you know yeah. war with that anthem yeah. and and uh, and the, the reality of it. Yeah. 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 Well, I think you probably are my reading audience. You're my demographic. So <laughs> that you caught it is a good sign. I'm glad to, notice, to know that you noticed that. This uh, it does have the themes of the of the nature that I was talking about. Uh, um, not so much mysticism is built into here, but the, mm. the, the nature is a theme and is an image. Um, and I also I was thinking because I talked about 2006. I wrote a lot then too. Some poems that got published, um, a handful of poems that got published um, about. That situation. And one of the things this poem captures that I was aware of in 2006 is the, the surrealness of it all, the, the surreality of sort of going about your everyday life, and yet it's not everyday, and yet there's this war and there's this death and this killing, which is uh, if you had a very strong arm, you could almost throw a stone and hit it in Gaza from where we live. And uh, of course, that's an exaggeration and a poetic image, but I mean, we're close. Mm-hmm. In terms of Minnesota terms, it's you're still in Minnesota, right? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't left Minnesota yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's this that also I think I, I mean I, I try to to make that come out in the poems because it's not something I ever thought about before I actually experienced it or even imagined. I guess. Um, now, as you were writing here, some of the poems they really interested me in terms of structure. For example, there's one. Um, called Mosquitoes that's broken into four pieces uh, with sort of lowercase Roman numerals d- dividing them. And I was very curious about that because I'm, I'm coming to writing more as a, a prose person who's sort of in awe of poets, but I'm not a poet myself except for a few haikus that I once published. Um, and I, I, I'm fascinated with the way that you broke that up, but I, I wondered... What do you gain when you decide to break a poem up into into different segments and and to talk a little bit about how poets use um, line breaks and white space in this kind of very artistic way that is a mystery to many of us, but there's a real thought process that goes into that. There is a thought process. Um, For me, I'm always looking at ways of doubling meaning, actually, often. Oftentimes my line breaks in particular— not necessarily the section breaks. I'll come back to the section breaks, but because you mentioned line breaks, sometimes I, I think about them in terms of where I put them. That while they might run across the line break as a sentence, by putting that break there, it suggests another meaning or another embedded sentence or another phrase. I think that that's a piece of it is is uh, trying to uh, the, you don't do in prose. I mean, I write prose too, although um, when I write flash fiction, I will divide them into sections sometimes with the uh, with Roman numerals. But I'll get to those in a moment. But the uh, the idea of the line break is bringing attention perhaps to things like uh, rockets, dread flares, like to break the line after that, even though the line, the sense keeps going forward, it helps me at least see something. I don't know whether readers notice it as much as, as I do. I'm conscious of doing it, and I hope that it has at least an unconscious effect. Now, the, the Roman numerals are a little bit different. I... They tend to be a matter of sort of breaking up scenes or sometimes they're uh, very different images that overlap, but there's a change. And I want the readers to, s- to see this change and to see that there's a relationship, but that it's some- I'm saying something different about the same theme or topic. And sometimes I'm making um, leaps. I think I, I, that's a Robert Bly phrase to, to, to make a leap where, where I'm really moving – in an unconscious way or letting my unconscious guide me and it's guiding me by um, or it's guiding me in ways that I don't always recognize myself but I I see that something I've written here is now making me jump or leap into another space and and I want to mark that to the readers I'm making a leap now it's it's artwork in a different way than prose is prose is art I write prose I write fiction Um, and fiction takes you through almost by the hand in some ways, at least parts of it, the, the, the narrative structure, the, the plot. I mean, I also write hybrid and I write experimental stuff, so some of my fiction maybe doesn't do that as much. But when I break it up in fiction, it's the same. 
thing though. I mean, it's like chapters or it's like scenes. It's like, okay, there's this, but now I'm going to tell you this and that's going to change what you think about. So like one, and I think when I come to two, that two maybe is going to make you change, think differently about what I was saying in one. And three maybe makes you think differently about two or one. And so I, I'm kind of marking it. And also perhaps sometimes it's to make it so it's not jarring to the reader. Is by having the, the the space in the Roman numeral, the reader says, "Ah, we're shifting gears." We're shifting, yeah. It's yeah. it's it's kind of uh, giving you directional signs when you're yeah. telling a story that might be nonlinear. Right, it's yeah. a door or yeah. something. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it says we're changing yes. now. Maybe you could read that piece, Mosquitoes. That's a powerful. Okay, one. I actually may have a different. You may have a newer. Ver- I thought I had the newer version, but I think you actually have it on your screen and I didn't get to it on my screen. So I'm going to read an older version so it may read a little bit differently. Mosquitoes. That some of those labeled as enemies have crossed the lines to offer condolences at the morning tents. That the morning families spoke to each other as parents and cried on each other's shoulders. That we cried for the children who died on both sides of the divide that the war began anyway, that hope must still remain with those who cross borders, ignore false lines and divisions, that children should be allowed to live, that we must cry for all children who die. For all of this, dear owl mothers, whose children have been murdered, do not call the sun to the dawn. Let us suffer the night of losses, Let us find the mosquito who started it all with his lies and rumors. First, we learn that the monkey killed your child. The monkey ran, alarmed by the crow's call. The crow called out warning when the rabbit ran, afraid. The rabbit was scared by the python who crept into its hole. The python feared that the lizard had plotted against it. The lizard simply hadn't heard a word. It had blocked its ears. In denial of mosquito propaganda, the lies and rumors of death, the drawing of lines that divide us with verbs we cannot put objects to, do not know subjects for. Do not call the sun to the dawn. Leave us suffering in the night of losses. I want to explain something. And I don't know if your version said in the African tale, and there is a line in the new version that says in the African tale, tells us there is an African tale. There's a story. It's one of the DVDs we have for our kids. And James Earl Jones reads, and in this tale, the mosquito buzzes in the lizard's ear, some nonsense and exaggeration, the lizard covers, and all these things happen in the reverse order of what I've had. And in the end, the, the owl's baby chick was killed. And so the owl doesn't call the sun to come up, mm-hmm. and they have a long night. So the king calls them and unravels the story backwards. And that's why the mosquito buzzes at night and you can't hear it because it's sort of the punishment. Hmm. And the owl mother eventually does call the sun back. So I'm kind of taking this African story and turning it around and saying, don't. Let us suffer the night until we solve the issues. Don't try to sort of sweep it all under the rug or candy coat it and that sort of thing. It was fascinating to me, and I found myself thinking about like, Life of Pi by Jan mm. Martel and this idea of, you know, the, the animals as, uh, I mean, George Orwell does this as well, the animals as, as characters, as kind of representations right. fable. of ourselves. Yeah, exactly. it's a fable. And I borrowed heavily from the African fable. <laughs> yeah. If I could read in James Earl Jones's voice, I would read the poem in that deep, beautiful voice. We would all like that. I would like <laughs> to read, like, Maya Angelou or something yeah. like that. <laughs> um, now, you were saying that uh, my version might be a little different than your version. I know this this collection is very close to publication and just to, maybe you're getting to make yeah. a few last changes. How is it as a poet when you create something and you feel like, well, maybe I still want to change it a little bit? How do you how do you know when it's done? I mean, is it a little bit like any other kind of writing that <laughs> at some point some publisher gives you a deadline or you've set a deadline for yourself and you say, well, well, that's it. I just I just have to yeah. let it go off into the world like like a child that you don't have full control of anymore. You exactly. just let the child walk. Like a child that goes out sometimes and behaves in ways that you didn't necessarily want it to. <laughs> out goes <Shocking>. the writing. <laughs> Shocking that they the do writing, that. And the writing does that too sometimes. Yeah. Um, 
I, every time I read something, I can make a change, uh, change a word, change a, a line break, something. And at some point, you have to stop. I think I learned that in newspapers, working with newspapers. You, you, production night, there's the deadline, and there's a point, unless you want to stay up all night, when you say, okay, put it to bed, it goes to press, we're done. Okay, we missed deny that needed dotting or whatever. It's, you have to, at some point, there, there's a, a, a line. That said, I mean, I, I, I think that some poets, I, Walt Whitman, I think, continued to revise Leaves of Grass while he was alive and, and, and reprint it in different editions. And I think that when you collect, a, you know, if I should ever come to a point where I collect my few books together into a larger collection, I might edit again. Or I might simply say enough, but... Um, I always want to change it. I don't. It's like it's. I'm never quite satisfied with it. In some ways, it's natural because it's it's almost like a living, breathing thing. Of course, it's going to change. It's hard to sort yeah. of set it in stone and just leave it. Well, it, it, it's a living, breathing thing, and it's also an expression of me. And I'm changing. And I'm not. I mean, I, I read something and I say that's not what I think anymore. Or that's not how I feel anymore. So that makes me want to change it. Or I have learned that. Oh, look, I can do something a little different here than I did and it will do what I want it to do and I discovered this or learned it reading someone else or writing something else and I mean it, I'm living breathing the text is as an extension of me is living and breathing and it does go out like our children I mean once it gets out into the world and people start reading it it, it doesn't behave according I, I can't control the reader's responses so in that way the poem or the story or whatever doesn't behave the way I might behave if I was there to keep telling people what to think about what I wrote. Right, right. You can't stand next to the reader and say, well, what this means is... Right, exactly. <laughs> you can't say, well, see, I'm trying to get surrealism in here, and did you notice the African <laughs> fable here, right. like I'm doing on Which, this interview? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I opened it, you know, to, <laughs> invited you to do that, but I, I didn't know about that fable, so now yeah. I want to go reread the fable and then reread your poem. Mm. Um, the title of this collection is War Surrounds Us. Um, yeah. And that touches on at the same time that you were um, experiencing the war here last summer, you were also kind of hearing the war drifting over, the sounds of it drifting over the border from, from Syria, Syria and the yeah. Golan. Yeah, we, we actually went up um, in August to Swat, where we, a friend of ours who has cats in a beautiful house goes away in the summer in August for a while. In the past couple of years, we've house sat and taken care of the cats. That was a nice break from the... We were further away from the Gaza war and the rockets and the and the alarms in the city of Jerusalem. When we went over, we went over actually apple picking. We could actually hear the rumbling of um, the fighting in Syria. And it, we were near the Kinetra crossing or right, I mean, within sight of it. And this was fighting just beyond it. That's one of the, you know, you asked me about, I wrote this poem, the poem, the title poem, War Surrounds Us. At the time, right after it, you know, we, these events happened, but then I came, I, I hadn't, put in the name of Conetra because I thought, well, no one will know what that is. But after the Conetra crossing became, the, the, the UN uh, soldiers got captured for a while and it became sort of a, a big news item. And I said, okay, I'm going to put the name of it. That's one of the changes I made. Mm, very interesting. Would you read War Surrounds Us? Sure. This was a, a hard one in some ways. Mm. <clears throat> War Surrounds Us. One. We have been in the north for a while in Sfat, on the mystical mountain across from Moron. When we arrived, rockets still flew toward Jerusalem. One the evening we left, another a few days later. The IDF continued to pound Gaza. Soldiers remained in embattled streets. Engineers destroyed tunnels. Civilians died. Two. Slowly, our son's discussion of rockets shifts, and he builds fewer with his blocks and Legos. Although they have not totally disappeared, even though... Three. Now a five-day ceasefire extension added to a 72-hour one that held join with talks in Cairo that pretend enough seriousness to end this battle. The war... That will continue. It doesn't stop. Four. These few weeks we have swum with Palestinians in the Sea of Galilee, smiled with Arabs as our children's ice creams melted in the summer sun. 
We rode tour boats where we danced with Arabs and Jews. 5. Today we picked apples in the Golan within sight of the Syrian border and heard the rumbling war there, booming cannon and mortar echoing across heated hills. Our son overhears our discussion with an orchard worker who moved here to raise his kids outside of the city, and our boy wants to see the booms. We tell him they are over the hills, which satisfies him for now. He happily rides in the trailer behind the tractor on our way to the rows of ripe galas and sandras overlooking the Canetra crossing. 6. What will we say to him about his time to join the army? 7. The wind blew strong from behind, and after the apples, sitting in shade, playing with our young children, we found three peacock feathers and a goose quill on the ground. As we drove away, the thunder rumbled a few rounds from the right, a few from the left. 8. We ate lunch in a Druze village, a table full of salads, majadra, chicken, lamb, hummus, a smiley face with Hebrew and Arabic for the name of the cafe. Out front, parked next to our car, a Massey Ferguson tractor. It reminds me of rural Minnesota, this tractor outside the cafe, like Hinkley, site of the great fire that glowed on skylines a hundred miles distant and melted railroad tracks. It's like being there, sitting at the A&W with a root beer float, people watching. Except for the Arabic, the Hebrew, the thunder of war just over the horizon. I love the juxtaposition <coughs> of those images, you know, could, mm. could feel like Minnesota with that truck, except yeah. for the, the yeah. rumble of war. Um, tell juxtaposition, me, that's a good word for some of those, why, why put those breaks with the numbers, juxtaposition. Juxtaposition, yeah, we like that, that term. You know, this idea of uh, um, sometimes we need her poetry, I think, to, to jar us a little bit. You know, I don't think... Every every poem should feel smooth and flowing, but mm. sometimes you know you, you need the juxtaposition, if I can mm. overuse the word, <laughs> of uh, you know of of uh, disparate images to to really feel th- what's happening in this poem. Dissonance. Dissonance is the perfect yeah, word. Dissonance there. in contemporary music too. You know, yes. it's the, that idea of exactly. Um, with <coughs> just a little bit of time that we have left, do you want to tell me just a, a little bit about your upcoming book of flash fiction, The Toad's Garden? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, flash fiction, maybe, you know, some people don't know what it is, so I'll explain just briefly. It's very short fiction. Depending on the journal and the definition, it could be 200 words, 1,000 words, 500 words, but it's not usually as much as 1,000 and almost never more. So it's very short, almost like prose poetry. There's, I, I find it uh, very hybridized with prose poetry because it's condensed and, and uh, it's not the leisure of a novel or a short story even. And I, I um, a little over a year ago, the, the, almost two years ago now, I guess, I was writing a bunch of flash fiction on my blog. Um, a lot of it was experimental flash fiction with the recurring character, the lady with the beard, <laughs> and uh, a lot of stuff about gender and uh, society and culture. Uh, mixed into these stories. And so we've collected some of that and some other, I mean, I've been writing flash fiction along the ways. So I've collected it into a, it, it's a little longer than a chapbook, I guess. Um, but I'm, each page as it's, I'm envisioning it is sort of broken up. I do have some sections as number one, number two, even though it's flash fiction, like there's two chapters or even though it's short. And I've broken those up into, to emphasize the similarity to prose poetry. Some of it's very experimental. I challenged people on my blog and on Facebook to give me words, loose associations of the first five words that occurred to you, and I would use a bunch of those, and I would tag them so they knew them. I would use them in creating the story. I would use their words, That's and great. people got challenged and started giving me really strange words, so there's some strange words. And I don't know. It was a fun game to play, but it built into something. Uh, the the Toad's Garden, the Toad's a recurring character also, and the the toad ends up being um, very metaphysical and sometimes political 
and maybe an alien. We don't know. <laughs> Michael, I always like to ask each of my guests on the show what they're writing life is like now, although I think I, I got a strong sense of that through our, our time together today. Um, but I'll just end with asking you that. Um, you talked about how earlier in your life you were a, a therapist, and, and despite that being your profession, you're always kind of writing on the side. Are, are you someone who just writes all the time when you feel like it, or do you, are you someone who kind of sets goals and schedules to you know when, when you're going to write and how you're going to get your writing done? I'm not a very goal-oriented person. <laughs> and I, I don't set goals and schedules. I'm not um, – I tend to find that if I try that, um, I'm not meeting them and either I'm battling against them or I'm beating myself up for not meeting them. Um, so I write when I feel like it. I write a lot. I write most of the time. I've written a couple of poems this week. Um, I don't know that they're good poems, but I, yeah, I've posted a couple of things on my blog. You know, I, I continue to write – um, sometimes there's long spells of not writing. I mean, I work for, I don't make money as a poet. I make money as a teacher. And, you know, when the semester's busy and things, I mean, be not writing so much or maybe writing when I should be doing other things like writing papers. Don't tell my students. No, we won't let them know. <clears throat> um, but I, uh, I'm more of a expressionist kind of person that way. I tend to write when I feel like writing. I have written on deadline. I have worked a little bit as a journalist, although mostly about books, book reviewing and stuff. But uh, I I can do that. But I tend to be – I write when I feel like it, and when I'm done, I send it out. I think that sounds like the, the happiest recipe for writing I've heard <laughs> so far. Michael Dickel – Poet, writer, photographer, artist. It's been a pleasure having you here on Let's Get Lit. Thank you, Eileen. Pleasure to be here. Looking forward to the next book. Thanks.